Good afternoon and welcome to the 15th in our series of speakers program presentations for the current semester. Our speaker today is Justice William O. Douglas of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Douglas was born in Minnesota and was and took his higher education in the state of Washington at Whitman College. He's been a member of the United States Supreme Court since 1939 when he was appointed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. So without any further words of mine, Justice Douglas. Uh, Mr. Chairman and friends, uh, I'm talking today about a very large subject um, in which I'm going to have to gallop to even touch the high spots, and for that I hope you forgive me. This is a, uh, a controversial subject. I do not ask you to uh, agree with me, but I think that I'm going to be talking about things that you and your generation are going to have to come to grips with uh, before you leave this life, and there are problems that uh, my generation largely neglected for a long period of time. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, political debates of the uh, 1776 period uh, should be the political debates of the 1960-1970 period. At that time, uh, we were the underdeveloped nations and we wanted political equality and economic opportunity. Uh, today, we're pretty much the big white house on the hill, surrounded by the slums of the world, uh, more or less out of uh, communication or touch with the conditions that exist in the world today. And so far, we have not seemed to have had the audacity to match the political thinking of the 18th century. We need today uh, visionary programs to match uh, the astounding problems that confront this generation. They all, or most of them, start with the advent of the nuclear age uh, and the arrival of a point where man is now able to destroy all life on all continents should he so desire. Uh, 610 megaton bombs exploded on a clear day. 30 miles above the earth would destroy all life on this continent. And uh, the same could be done on other continents. Uh, the prevention of uh, war, in other words, uh, becomes the first preeminent task of the, of the times, and um, how do we proceed to that end? The uh, <clears throat> assumption that a, a great power can be uh, counted upon to accept humiliation rather than war is a very dangerous one. The assumption that the United States can dictate other nations' foreign policy is a very dangerous one. The assumption that the United States can bend world events to our own way of thinking is a very dangerous one. And it's also very dangerous to uh, live in a world uh, to where you generate the uh, a feeling of, of universal distrust. A very eminent uh, member of my court once said, Oliver Wendell Holmes, universal distrust creates universal, universal incompetence. Universal distrust creates universal incompetence. In 15 years, uh, there will be 15 nations that will have the nuclear weapon. I read in your local paper this morning a uh, column by a man who uh, seated me at this platform, I understand, who thinks now is the time to drop the bomb on Red China. Uh, <clears throat> she does have the bomb and she will have means of delivering it perhaps uh, in five years or ten years, but there's very little comfort in, in, in uh, 
any uh, freewheeling uh, race for, for the bomb by all the nations. Perhaps the uh, major threats will come from the nuclear, uh, the junior nuclear club. Uh, there's even the uh, peaceful use of atomic uh, energy produces international problems when it comes to things like the disposal of the, uh, of the waste material that is radioactive for 500 or 1,000 years and what should, do, what, what should be done with that, uh, how uh, international safeguards can be uh, designed so that uh, the, uh, those very dangerous products will not poison the earth 500 years from now. Uh, there's no possibility, in my view, of controlling uh, clashes that breach the peace or controlling aggressive war or the nuclear problems of this age unless all nations are in the United Nations. There are now uh, 112 members, but there's no effective rule of law possible with Peking outside the United Nations. The fact that Peking would be in the United Nations, of course, is not an automatic solution, but it's the only, only a beginning, but without it, there's hardly a beginning. Uh, there was a refusal on the part of Peking to uh, arbitrate with the, the, her border dispute with India, there was no UN pressure to put upon Peking. Uh, we are making progress. We have been making progress with Russia because possession of the nuclear bomb produces mutual fear and respect on both sides. And we will in time, I think, be forced to listen to Peking and also Peking will be forced to listen to us. One thing I think that is very basic in the thinking about these world problems is that the deterrent power, so far as history teaches us anything, is largely illusory. We in the law know that the death sentence is no deterrent to murder because our felony statistics in Minnesota and Michigan, where the death penalty has been abolished for years, uh, no, are not drastically different from those of California, where you still have it, or New York, where it still ha has it. The piling up of uh, armament, the massing of nuclear resources at the military level is bound to lead to war. And abolishing nuclear weapons is not enough for now that we know how to make them. Once a major conflict started, the one that uh, could remake them, reproduce them would be certain to win. So the prevention of war, the prevention of war is a foremost problem of of your age and of all mankind. I suppose if you go back far enough, you would, even a uh, hundred years ago or more, a world without slavery would seem to be an impossible uh, condition because slavery had been so long persistent in the world. Or a world without religious persecution might have seemed to be impossible at the time of the crusade. But uh, those have been largely eliminated and so can the scourge of war. The test ban, nuclear test ban treaty was certainly a step in the right, right direction. Disarmament uh, is the only remedy, slow and cumbersome as it is, but inspection may come earlier than we think through the use of, of the, of the uh, satellites. There are very sharp cleavages in the world, and those are the things that are emphasized in the daily press. The United Nations reflects all the cleavages and all the differences in the world, and they are very deep. There are communist groups and democratic groups and feudalistic groups. There are the developed nations and the underdeveloped nations, and the underdeveloped nations are largely feudal or fascist in nature.
Uh, the common ground is sometimes very difficult to find and once found difficult to maintain. And we often curse uh, the sovereign state as the villain responsible for our woes today. But I personally think that the Western world and Russia and China, while enshrining different concepts of freedom and, and justice, have gone far to organize men into an infinite, infinite variety into cooperative activities. Apart from the weapons system, the world system as, I, as it exists today is probably better by most standards than any previous world condition that existed. And as the real inutility of the weapons system becomes apparent and its burdens become persistent, more rational means will be adopted. A demilitarized world will not and could not eliminate the infinite power struggles inherent in the nature of man, but what it can do is to eliminate the war system that carries the awful risk of reducing the world these days to radioactive rubble. As we <coughs> view the world scene today, we, we see uh, great divisions even in the communist world. Russia with a standard of living of about $900 a year per capita uh, is very anxious. Her people are very anxious to get some of the dividends from her new bustling industrial plan. Uh, <coughs> the twin tasks for the two present major nuclear powers in your time are to put to rest the the clashes of their political interests and to foster cooperative efforts in their common interests. Uh, <clears throat> Russia's ideological split with China goes back to 1957 when Russia withdrew all economic aid. And this is a complex of many things. First is the, there's the fear of China. I don't know how many of you have seen Siberia I was raised in Yakima, Washington, to think it was a desolate place filled with salt mines, but Siberia is handsome country, something like northern Minnesota and southern Canada. It's twice the size of the United States and has only 18 million people in it, and China could put in 300 million people and Siberia would still be not as heavily populated as the United States. Outer Mongolia that is larger than Europe has only a million people and it's a buffer between Russia and China. And the last thing that the premier of Russia thinks about every night before he turns over the last time to go to sleep is uh, the Chinese pressure in the east. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Chinese in the universities in, in Russia are called the blue ants because they get straight A's. They're very eager beavers. The Russian is something like the American who likes to take Friday night and Saturday off. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, uh, contests and tensions between Russia and China are mounting on the African scene these days because the Chinese are very active in Africa these days in promoting war and dissension along the color line. And when it comes to color, the Russians are white like the rest of us in the Western world. Uh, Russia, for various reasons of the advance in her uh, society and the development of her industrial plant wants coexistence. Red China, <coughs> Uh, not yet ready to uh, carry on extensive AID programs around the world wants a world in conflict because she cannot as yet compete at the technical level in the area of the underdeveloped nation. Red China <coughs> is in an expansionist mood trying to rebuild uh, China as it was uh, under the Manchus and even earlier. Uh, <coughs> 
These are part of the, of, of, of the world forces that are shaping up over which, of course, we have no control. Uh, <clears throat> many think that uh, Russia is devious and cannot be trusted. Probably no nation can be trusted uh, where uh, her, her, her self-interest is in conflict with another's, another nation's uh, self-interest. Uh, Russia is in many ways devious by our standards because we of the West uh, think pretty much in terms of poker while R Russia thinks in terms of chess. And the Cuban missile episode was largely misunderstood in this country because it was tied to Iran and to Turkey and not an isolated episode. Uh, there is a great uh, uh, change underway in the world. The economic and political integration of Europe will probably help in the decrease of polarization between the United States and Russia because a Europe of that stature would probably be the true third force. And it would be one of the stabilizing influences towards the development I think of a rule of law and the prevention of war. And then there is, of course, the United Nations. If we didn't have the United Nations, we would have to invent it. It fills some needs. It's a sanctuary for nations that are weak and insecure. It a, provides a world forum for airing world problems. Uh, the protection of the rights of the great powers took the form of a veto in the Security Council. With the increase in the power of the General Assembly, there is agitation for change. Uh, some ideas being that there should be weighted voting. So far, the United States has pretty much had its way in the United Nations. But this oncoming generation must prepare for the day when the small nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America will outvote us. Uh, compromise <coughs> is now being uh, sought uh, as respects the penalty for being in arrears on the payment of, of assessments. And I think that whatever the answer is, it will, there will be an answer that the United Nations will not disrupt over such an issue because I think all nations, large and small, realize the vital importance in this nuclear age of maintaining some uh, uh, embryonic form of world government such as we do have in the United Nations. It is embryonic at the legislative level, at the judicial, at the administrative, at the executive. It's embryonic. The legislative uh, level was um, uh, perhaps most uh, distinguished in outlawing aggressive war when the um, conflict developed in Korea. It was police action, I think, that was highly principled. Uh, the Soviets called it war, and Eisenhower in his 52 campaign called it war. But it was the first time civilized nations had moved for collective action against aggressive movement of troops. The UN Emergency Force created for the Suez Crisis still operates. Another was created for Lebanon in 58. One was sent to the Congo in 1960 and one to Cyprus in 1964. Each of them had deficiencies, but those deficiencies are those of the international order itself. Mosi Tung believes that war is the highest form of struggle and that is the idea that conflicts with the needs for survival in this nuclear age. At the administrative level, the United Nations has had a very distinguished record, as those of you who travel abroad into the underdeveloped areas will see. The technical missions have been outstanding. The children's unit has rendered Tremendous service in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. UNESCO has been particularly outstanding 
in Latin America. The special fund administered by Paul Hoffman is trying to train the one million or some of the one million managers that are needed for the underdeveloped nations, skilled managers and technicians. It has trained 30,000 so far. Uh, it is collaborating with each nation in making an inventory of local resources and of possible industries. The judicial function of the United Nations is in the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is largely crippled as a judicial tribunal by the Connolly Amendment in this country uh, by which uh, we accept the jurisdiction of the International Court in substance if we like its decisions and reject its decisions if we don't like them. And since we have attached that condition, any nation that we sue in the United Nations International Court of Justice uh, by reciprocity has the same uh, qualified acceptance. And that means that in this troubled era of great international conflict and discord when, 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 the, when the, the week is filled with, uh, with cases and controversies that could go to that court, the court is practically without work. We had in the court in 62 one judgment rendered and three cases remaining on the docket. In 1963, we had one judgment rendered and two cases remaining on the do docket. Uh, we had 3,184 cases in our Supreme Court this last term. And I would think that if we were on our way to a quick development of the rule of law in the world, that uh, we and like-minded nations would free the uh, uh, international court of the of the restrictions such as the Connolly Amendment. I personally have great uh, respect for the International Court of Justice. Its judges are nominated by national groups of jurists, not by government. Those select, elected must receive an absolute majority of both General Assembly and the Security Council. I often wondered why the Berlin issue was never submitted to the International Court. I bet you there's not a single person in this audience that has not made up his or her mind on the merits of the Berlin issue. But I would suspect there's not one percent of the people in this room who've ever read the conventions out of which the Berlin issue grew because it, it is an uh, issue that involves the construction of agreements, of the four-party agreement following World War II. Uh, that is ideal for a judicial disposition. The executive fu uh, functions of the United Nations are in the Secretary General that uh, Hammerskold brought to high distinction. And when Khrushchev a few years back trotted out the idea of a, of a troika, of a three-man uh, office of Secretary General, we all poo-pooed it, but I suspect that it may have great appeal to Americans pretty soon. When uh, the neutral groups or other groups around the world become more powerful, and when we see that uh, U.S. domination is no longer possible. We have uh, uh, ingredients for the uh, development of a rule of law in great quantity. But a rule of law as a substitute for a military solution requires, of course, a consensus. It's not a unilateral thing that we can impose. It means agree agreements among nations. And there are limits to which you can get a consensus. We in the United States would not agree to a consensus on the surrender of our liberties, of our right of freedom of speech, of our right of religious freedom, and so on. There would be no consensus uh, possible, as I see it, that would 
establish a Western military outpost in Laos or a consensus that would establish a communist military outpost in Mexico. The kind of consensus that are immediately practical are of the following variety. First, a consensus that provides procedural devices for keeping conflicts from triggering the nuclear holocaust. Ground rules must be provided that bring an issue to conference, then to war. Now in the labor management field, we have a comparable device, and a consensus among nations is necessary to produce a like remedy in the international field. You know, Mr. Khrushchev, and I suspect we, we, we may miss the old gentleman, on January 1st, 1964, made a very significant speech. It was poo-pooed in most circles in this country as being propaganda, <clears throat> and it may have been in purpose, but I would have liked to, and I think all who were interested in the development of rule of law would have liked to have him taken up on that proposal, and that was an international agreement not to use force to alter existing state frontiers, but to use negotiation, mediation, or other conciliatory procedure to settle boundary disputes. It's the same idea that the uh, Shastri, the Prime Minister of India, stated recently in Cairo that border disputes everywhere should be resolved through negotiation, not force. And it seems to me that As a starter, a consensus upon that uh, procedure should be readily possible at the world level. A consensus among like-minded nations to settle all their controversies by law would, uh, I think, advance the the. Uh, the the arrival of a rule of law by leaps and bounds. Like-minded nations, I include, of course, England and France and, and the European nations and Israel and, and uh, Mexico and, and uh, Bolivia, the two democratic nations in the, in the south, in, south of us. Um, we ought to be able to band all them together. Uh, into a consensus to settle all controversies by law. This means, of course, the repeal of the our Connolly Amendment and American leadership in rallying as many nations as possible to this point of view. But I think that the influence of, of such an announcement would be con contagious. It would mean the use of conciliation, mediation, arbitration, as well as the use of, of the world court. Uh, third, it would mean a consensus to bring into the United Nations all countries of the world so that the institutions of the United Nations might be available for mediation and adjudication of all issues that may threaten world peace. A series of consensus of the kind mentioned would provide a bare skeleton for a rule of law, not a full-fledged system, but if the nuclear holocaust is to be avoided, the pattern of conduct produced by even a 10-year regime under a rule of law would produce the greatest sense of security I think that mankind has only known and it's only in that environment I believe that substantial progress can be made towards disarmament. There's much more than the United Nations to this problem of the rule of law. There are large areas that can be governed that can be controlled only through an extension of what we call in this country the principle of federalism. The regional compacts that are necessary to bring federalism into being as active uh, promoters of the rule of law are numerous. NATO, of course, is one. We have in this uh, hemisphere the beginning of <coughs> 
a regional arrangement in OAS, but OAS uh, lacks a, a judicial tribunal and it needs one and we should create one so that it can uh, lend its services to handling justiciable controversies arising under conventions and treaties and the like. And I've often thought that OAS needs a military establishment so that OAS can stand up against military coups against democratic regimes. Had such an agency existed, Bosch would have remained in power in the Dominican Republic and had a chance to plant the seeds of democracy there. Uh, he would have had a chance to remain in power until the, in, until the next, uh, next election. Uh, whether that would be politically feasible in OAS, I do not know, but I know there is some sentiment for it. Uh, the uh, development of uh, principles of federalism such as we know it in this country have made considerable progress in Europe, not through NATO, but through the European Commission of Human Rights and the U European Court of Human Rights, whereby a citizen of Germany, deprived of rights in England, or England, Englishman deprived of rights in Italy or Belgium, can bring proceedings before the International Commission and the International Court of Human Rights. I commend uh, the record of that commission and that court to you. It has rendered uh, very outstanding uh, decisions uh, going very far to make uh, the, the Bill of Rights of the uh, European uh, community, which is somewhat broader than our own Bill of Rights, a real living force among the, the common people. Uh, <clears throat> we need, uh, in Asia, we probably, uh, more than any other place, a regional development of compacts, of, of uh, arrangements. Otherwise, we will be going from one sad uh, Vietnam situation to a sadder one. Uh, CETO was created by France and England. Uh, CETO is obsolete. Uh, when the uh, Laos uh, crisis developed, uh, France and Pakistan refused to send forces. Australia, Britain, New Zealand, the Philippines offered only token forces. Uh, it's an American operation in Vietnam. CETO is pretty much a paper organization. Uh, we must remember that the day of the white man has, has ended. We must forget the Rudyard, uh, Rudyard Kipling view of uh, Asian affairs. We have much to contribute to building political institutions in Asia but the political institutions that they need at the present time against the dissolution of countries like Vietnam are organizations of the large Asian nations um, for defense, for the common market, for the administration of uh, their, their common affairs, for the handling of judicial disputes, and for the uh, processing of all sorts of regional grievances. Uh, Asia needs India and Pakistan and Malaysia and Japan and all the large nations in its uh, regional organization, else the, the problems will be out of hand. Certainly the United States and our experience in Vietnam shows how futile intervention is at that level. Uh, this uh, idea of uh, the regional compacts, uh, regional federalism, so to speak, has one uh, 
singularly important aspect, and that is the problem of the common market. As you view the world scene, it is the alignment of, of the haves versus the have-nots. To get put things somewhat in perspective, let me say this, that our appropriation to the Pentagon each year is greater than the total national income of 700 million Chinese under the Peking regime. In 1962, the underdeveloped nations in the free world had a gross national product of about 212 billion. Ours in this country was 556 billion. In 63, we made it 650 billion. In 1962, our gross national product plus Europe's was one little over one billion. Uh, as the system is designed in today, the great risk is that the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. And in your time, in your time, you will have a world conflict that uh, will be bitter more bitter than anything that, uh, that, that the world has ever seen. Uh, those of you interested could uh, go into the study of Mexico. I mentioned Mexico was one of the democratic nations of Latin America. The history of Mexico since 1920 shows that the disparity between the top and the bottom is greater now than it was then. How do you handle the, the problem of bridging the gap, of seeing to it that, that poverty does not multiply while riches at the other end multiply? The population has, explosion has meant that in underdeveloped nations, the standard of living today is lower than it was probably a generation ago, with few exceptions. The efforts to teach people to read has been largely nullified. Prospects for democracy seem very dim. The minimum, the minimum annual growth rate for underdeveloped nations is estimated by our experts at 5%. But to maintain that growth rate, those underdeveloped nations need to increase their annual exports by at least $20 billion. They now experience declining prices for exports and increased prices for imports. Um, and our concern is, and Europe's concern, is building a rich man's common market when our concern must be somehow or other creating preferential tariff treatments for the underdeveloped nations because they're going to be high-cost producers and they will not be able to compete with the low-cost mass producers. They need some kind of preferential treatments. What the answer to this problem is, no one knows, but it is a problem that is today largely neglected. And it has dangerous uh, potential because the haves, my friend, are the whites, and the have-nots are the yellows, the blacks, and the browns, and the greatest conflict ever known will take place unless this problem is solved. The foreign aid from all the developed nations to the underdeveloped nations runs about four billion a year in terms of net capital transfer to underdeveloped nations. And that does not make a very great economic dent. We get deluded by foreign aid by looking at the massive amount that we give, but we overlook that 67% of our foreign aid is in the form of military aid, enabling little uh, colonels around these underdeveloped nations to overthrow democratic governments. If we invested abroad as heavily in proportion to our national income as Britain did in the 19th century, we would be putting into underdeveloped nations for economic purposes about $30 billion a year.
Those who support the tradition of the free society should make the rule of law their way of life. And there are a considerable number, like India and Japan and Israel and England and Europe and Turkey and Nigeria and the Philippines and so on. We must get a consensus with the Soviet Sino block on ground rules to avoid military clashes. And we must in time get a consensus with the Soviet Sino bloc to use rule of law rather than force. The desire for a rule of law with justice and equality I think is, is deep in all peoples. One thing that we cannot do and one thing that the Russians and the Chinese cannot do is to create conformity out of the world's diversity. But we can, I think, develop uh, a harmony and make the, the, the harmony in the settlement of controversies the end result of the nuclear age. And the international rule of law year, my friends, should be the year 1965 and it should be part of your earnest undertaking. Thank you very much. Justice Douglas will entertain questions as soon as those of you who have one o'clock classes have departed. Have I read the Communist Manifesto? Yes. Uh, and I wrote the, an, an answer to it called Democracy's Manifesto. But I didn't get the other part of the question. How can I say after reading the Communist Manifesto that Russia wants peaceful coexistence? Well. Uh, even the communists change with the passage of time. You go to Yugoslavia and you find a communist nation that is to the to the right of Russia. Russia is to the right of, uh, of Red China. Uh, these uh, uh, political theory gives way under the pressure of, of, of uh, d development and the Russians are realists today why do I say they're realists? Because when you go to Russia and you talk to the Russians about the, about the nuclear bomb, the horrors of nuclear war that they give you are what the American scientists have written about, like Harrison Brown in his book, The Community of Fear. They're, they're realists. And they're, they're people before they're, they're communists, like we're people before we're Democrats or Republicans. I think that was part of the calculation, yes, that the, the, the Cuban and the Iran and the Turkey thing were, were associated. We're hoping that there would be a swap for the Cuban bases. Well, I think they, uh, to some extent, they attained their objective because we did remove our sites from Turkey, at least. That's what the Russians call the Chinese oh, students. Excuse me, I correct. Uh, uh, and you made a comment uh, indirectly about United States students, which I wish, which 
I wish you would elaborate, uh, <laughs> suggesting that the United States students uh, were similar to Russian students with regard to and in relation to Chinese attitudes uh, towards uh, study. That is, why are uh, American students like Russian students and unlike Chinese students? <laughs> well, I can say, answer that this way, and I shouldn't uh, answer on the basis of the present generation of students. I'll just go back to my own generation of students. The Russians are very much like uh, the Americans. We're all more or less extroverts, doers, a builder of dams and highways, super highways, and apartment houses, and so on. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Russian has a great sense of humor. Uh, the Russian uh, likes to knock off uh, Friday night and drink beer. Uh, probably that no longer happens, but in my day it did. <laughs> <coughs> now the Chinese student <coughs> isn't a superior being by those standards, but he comes out of an environment where he gets a bowl of rice a day and when he hits Russia he hits the flesh pots and he loves to stay there uh, because the standard of living in China is eighty dollars a year per person in Russia it's nine hundred and he can even get steak in Russia and he wants to stay there to stay there he has to be straight A's so he doesn't drink beer at night he works all night and he, and he beats the Russians. The Russians get the B's and the Chinese get the A's and that's why they don't like the Chinese student. Well, uh, that is a problem common to every court. Uh, uh, in the Federalist Papers, uh, you'll read Hamilton's words that the judicial branch of our government is the weakest because we don't have either the power of the purse or the power of the sword. Uh, the decisions of your courts in California are accepted uh, not because they have men with guns going around enforcing the decrees, but because of the consensus of Californians to live under a rule of law. Our decrees in the Supreme Court in Washington are accepted largely for the same reason. Once in a while you have Little Rock, once in a while you have Oxford, Mississippi, once in a while you have uh, a John Marshall like he was in 1824 challenged by the governor of Georgia and so on. But those are the exceptions over the long sweep. And uh, that would be the exception uh, I think in, in, at the international level uh, because the agreement to submit means the agreement to abide by the decisions. The question is whether or not the decision of the court under the, in the public accommodations cases under the Commerce Clause rather than under the Fourteenth Amendment strengthened or weakened the act. Uh, I don't think it, uh, I don't think that, uh, that uh, it makes much difference in that respect. The commerce power is as firmly anchored in the Constitution as is the power of the Congress under Section 5 of the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, some of us preferred a decision under the 14th Amendment, and I so wrote, uh, thinking that human rights were more important than, than hamburgers. But Is my criticism of the Connolly Amendment somewhat unfair in view of the fact that Congress would not have accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court without it? Uh, I think it probably is unfair in that technical, historic sense, but that was back in 1946, nearly 20 years have passed, and we should have learned something. <laughs> 
And the fact that it was good at the time doesn't mean that it's good for all time. We should get rid of it. I don't know enough about that one specific case to uh, to comment. We do have deeply ingrained in the uh, in, in our system of government at the federal level for federal crimes two institutions: the grand jury and the petty jury. And we put those in uh, to protect the the people against arbitrary action by a prosecutor who, in the early days, was a representative of uh, of the King of England. And we wanted the community uh, t to judge whether or not a charge, criminal charge, should be brought by presentment or indictment. That's in the in the Fifth Amendment. And uh, we know, in times of passion and prejudice, that sometimes a particular community uh, refuses to act, and we we get a failure of justice. But uh, overall, we have had a very good experience with the grand jury and the jury because it's been overall over the long period of time a much better system than merely a system of of a, a prosecutor deciding when to move and a judge deciding whether the person is guilty or not uh, the buffer between of the grand jury and the petty jury between government has been one of the great safeguards of liberty in the uh, Western world. The, the law to be applied would be the law of, of the particular convention. The four-party agreement covering Berlin provides the rules under which the parties agreed to abide. And you wouldn't be making up a rule of law out of the thin air like at the common law. You would be construing that particular treaty or that particular convention and deciding the meaning of those particular words. I don't know. Uh, the question is, we uh, why did the, uh, why did the court deny certiorari? No, I'm not asking why they denied well, the reason they denied it was because there were not four votes to grant it. That's the. <laughs> but you want to know a decision? You want a decision on the merits? <laughs> uh, well, I suppose I should not get into that. I would. Uh, we have cases coming up that involve it. I'd probably be the best part of discretion to abstain from expressing a point of view prior to, prior to the decision. Well, it's a uh, question as to the, as to the uh, first, the meaning of Article 19. This is relating to the non-payment of dues by Russia, France, and others to support uh, uh, missions, military missions that they didn't agree with. Uh, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that uh, perhaps, perhaps Article 19 should be abolished. I don't know. Uh, it was put in uh, 
at, at the very beginning, perhaps the experience, our experience under our Constitution has led to 24 different amendments. Maybe Article 19 should be amended. Maybe we should take a new look at it. Uh, maybe the conflicts in the world are so severe and so great that, that uh, it, it imposes too much of a burden. Suppose that, uh, suppose that the um, United Nations decided to send a, uh, an expeditionary force to, the, to go to the aid of North Vietnam and we refuse to pay our, our dues. Maybe we're dealing with th things too explosive at this stage to, to handle in that way. Uh, I don't know. The whole thing is up for uh, debate in, in the next few days, I think. I read in, the, in your Los Angeles Times this morning, I, I believe that, uh, the Secretary General's uh, uh, statement that he had a, what he thought was a compromise. Well, uh, th that is the question relates to the uh, underdeveloped nations and how they can participate in, in, the, in the common market, reach the rich markets of the world. Um, when you go to Africa, you'll find that the African nations are insisting upon a, uh, a protective tariff that would protect them against the inroads of uh, goods from the uh, mass production nations and a preferential tariff that would let their goods into the European nations or the, into, the, into the American market. And probably th something like that will have to be worked, worked out and adopted. Otherwise, uh, th they will never be able to compete. Otherwise, all this theory about uh, uh, bringing technology and science uh, and modern business management to the problems of underdeveloped nations will just be empty, empty phrases because you'll have the markets of the world dominated by, by the, the mass producing nations. And you cannot uh, run a world on that basis because the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer and you will have uh, in your time a, uh, a great world disorder with, with, with dimensions wholly different from anything we've ever known. Do I care to comment on Mr. Justice Black's bitter dissent? <laughs> In what? Uh, you mean the uh, the abatement of that was a uh, d different way of reading uh, a statute whether it uh, it applied to cases that had not that had been finished in the state courts but had not been uh, uh, finished in our court <coughs> what did Congress intend I didn't think the I don't know the bitter sounds more like a newspaper uh, <laughs> comment than uh, anything I read into it it was a, it was a uh, wholehearted dissent, but... Well, uh, I uh, thought that myself, personally, that it was an errand of mercy and uh, without any political overtones. Uh, you must remember, however, that in the world perspective, those things acquire different dimensions. <coughs> 
first place, uh, life is not valued as highly in many parts of the world as it is here. The loss of a couple hundred people is, uh, is, is, is of, of very little concern, or a couple million people, or a couple of hundred million people in some areas is not a, a very great concern. Uh, we have different, different standards. Behind all this Congo thing are the horrible atrocities committed by Leopold when he ran the Congo. Uh, you can uh, go to the library and find out how many Congolese hands were cut off by Leopold and preserved in formaldehyde uh, to show visitors. Uh, you, have, you have in the Congo uh, at the present time um, the uh, products, the fruits of seeds that were sown long time ago. It's, I don't think it's fair to judge Africa on the basis of the Congo. Am I satisfied that the difference between Russia and China are real? Oh, I'm sure they are. You think that Russia and China will come together? That's perhaps you're right. Perhaps they will. It'll surprise uh, it'll surprise all the Russians if that happened. <laughs> What, what will be the specific form of, a, of the conflict between the whites on the one side and the colored races on the other? I, I don't, um, I hope that that doesn't uh, uh, arise. I, w I mentioned it merely as a, a problem to bring to the forefront in all of our planning and discussion and debate so that it wouldn't happen. Uh, if it did happen, it would uh, happen in a series of things such as the Chinese are generating in the Congo today over and over and over again. Uh, <clears throat> China, while she is p a poor nation with $80 per person, with a, ver with a very, very low standard of living, has a lot of money for the export of, of trouble. And it's, uh <clears throat> Africa needs a million trained managers. It's much more difficult to to produce a million trained managers who are willing to go to Africa to work than it is to go to Africa and stir up dissension. And uh, that's what the, the Chinese are doing. It would be a, it would be a, a, a situation like the, like the Congo. The connection between the right to travel and what? Well, I suppose that the <clears throat> if you were confined to your your dormitory and not able to get about to see what is going on on the campus or in the town or in this country, that you would. Uh, uh, have a develop a very narrow vision, perhaps. Um, I suppose that the right to the right to travel is is a, a part of the right to know or access to information. That the uh, First Amendment f freedoms are not just freedoms in the ab abstract; they're freedoms in the actual setting of life, which I think would include a very large degree of travel or the ability to travel, or the freedom to travel. <clears throat>
think if we just head straight out over here to our right.